the old world is ending, and we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the structural problems in our world and the real solutions that we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse into a collaborative and sustainable futuristic society that serves all life. You may think it's an impossible dream, but the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Zachary Marlowe, Matt Holton, and Amanda Smith. And together, when we can move past this economic absurdity to come together and actualize our collective potential to create something completely new, we are Moneyless Society. Our guest today is ecological industrialist Robert Shields. For the last 22 years, Robert has been researching the root issues of energy, food, and waste, looking for end-game solutions to our collective challenges as a species. For the first part of the 21st century, Robert worked in the green mecca of Portland, Oregon. Then he started a TV show and a construction company focused on the dynamic relationships between systems and bringing simple solutions to clients and the public alike. For the last decade, Robert has been on the front line helping a coal town and an oil state move beyond their fossil fuel addiction. And Robert believes these projects can serve as a case study for how the U.S. can emerge over the next decade as leaders of the fossil free world. As the executive director of the Alliance for Reason and Knowledge, he has organized resiliency conferences, organized solar tours, and is building a training center for the next generation of permaculture professionals. During the pandemic, he continues to organize people and empower groups to lead a food revolution, which will stimulate the growth of local living economies as the end game solution to the climate crisis. Thank you for coming on our show, Robert. We are super happy to have you on. How are you doing today? I am recovering. Um, this has been a long decade fighting on what I believe is the front line of a rapidly changing climate. And I recently got a chance to escape for a little while and go visit some friends in the Northeast and family and get some perspective on why we must fight, why we can't let a single day pass without making some kind of effort to make a better world for tomorrow. If we don't do it, who will? Yeah, we've waited too many generations for the buck to be passed, uh, for someone else to do it. And this idea of retiring and, you know, letting somebody else deal with the problems um, just isn't plausible anymore. Even on vacation, I had a hard time sleeping in a hotel that only had 10 percent occupancy while people were sleeping on the street outside. Um, you know, this shit, like Jock Fr Fresco says, this shit's got to go. And we need to set bold goals with timelines in order to be able to achieve the momentum necessary to overcome these obstacles. If it's like the, uh, you know, it's like the old saying goes, you know, set your ambitions for the skies. And even if you fail, you will still land among the stars. We can't be afraid of failing. You know, we fail every day when we don't try. And I don't know what kind of efforts I'm going to be able to make, but I do know that it will not be, uh, it will not be for lack of effort. So many people uh, seem so totally averse to just staring the problem in the face. And it seems like th that so many people who are out there calling attention to like, this is not working, this shit's got to go, that they get labeled as pessimistic or, or you're just being negative. When in reality, the real negativity comes from ignoring the problem to the point where it, it's, it's inevitable and it's in our face. And if we don't actually focus on the problem, if we don't take it upon ourselves, every day of our lives to do this, it will be inevitable. And I think ultimately doing nothing is the most negative fate imaginable. Yeah, and I, I dealt with that my last 22 years. Just a, a, a note to attach to Marlo's uh, point about being negative. I am often met with people who say, oh, you're just so negative all the time. You're always down about this and complaining about that. You're just a negative Nelly. Uh, and I like to, uh, my rebuttal for that is basically, no, I'm positive that we can make a change and turn this whole thing around and, and we need to no longer deal with these negative systems that, that we're, you know, allowing to ruin our life and our planet. Really what I've been looking for for the last 22 years is solutions and focusing on solutions. You know, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of presentations and a lot of research done into the problems and the challenges, and it's almost become a culture. You know, we've got conferences that all just focus on how bad things are and how much we need to change. And But the sad thing is, at the end of the day, they're either, um, when it comes to talking about solutions, the conference ends or it's give us your money, we're going to pass this law, and you know we get this person elected, and that's how things are going to change. 
And while I agree that policies are basically the what we nurture to create uh, an economic uh, economic society that nurtures culture, um, you know, it's not the only way to act. And I think at this point, with government being so dysfunctional, even the best plans for government intervention are going to fall short if that's the only action we take. And as I've been focusing on finding solutions, it's really teaching people to, to learn to live without the government, not in an anti-government capacity or anything like that, but simply recognizing that the way things are run in the government right now needs to radically change, and they need time to do that. And so we need to start relying and working with each other. And this is the community that we had before government. You know, people were getting along and working well and and coexisting peacefully before governments came along. And I think that it's important if we want to have a um, healthy relationship with the governments of the world, that we need to be less dependent upon them for services, um, which creates a really negative uh, environment of abuse and addiction and dependence. And that's kind of where we're at now. You know, Alaska's big problem isn't the fact that it had oil. It's the fact that it failed to diversify its economy like Iceland did. It seems like what government has come to mean today, and that it, it's a polarizing, triggering word for so many people. I mean, conservatives seem to have this totally irrational aversion to all forms of government that are not the police, the military, the CIA, the FBI, and all the forms of punishment that it has. But I think for me, it's like what a government is and what it should be is people dealing with their problems collectively, working together to deal with their problems. That's not what governments of the world are today they're a sort of middleman between you know human life and corporations governments of today do not exist to help the people they exist to use them to uh, to achieve an end to, to gain something and i think one of those big uh, sort of incumbent corporate industries that backs our entire government is fossil fuels and the fossil fuel industries are one of the the biggest chokeholds on human life progress and prosperity they really are choking things and I've been reading a lot of uh, Buckminster Fuller lately, getting really into him. I mean, he's just a, a true visionary. He was talking in the 70s about, you know, the cartel of uh, governments and big business and corporations and things like that. And I think just about every episode of our show so far, somebody has said this beautiful quote of his that, you know, to uh, make the out the existing, you, you don't rail against the existing system. You make a new model that makes it obsolete. And I think that's an amazing sentiment. And I, I, I believe it. But I also feel that the fossil fuel industry really epitomizes, like we've had solutions to our energy problems for decades, decades and decades. And the fossil fuel industries are these big incumbent industries that have worked with governments to keep solar energy, to keep renewable energy, to keep geothermal and wind and all of these uh, healthier alternatives from being implemented. That we have models, we have alternatives, but it's sadly governments of the world have become this sort of wall to keep people from being able to deal with their own problems. Well, my research has indicated what's really happened is the governments that we created, the, that the founding fathers created, have basically been hijacked and have been taken over by corporate pirates. And that, that these governments now serve their interest and not ours. And that's why I'm very fond of the Robin Hooding uh, potential of being able to return the power to people by teaching them to grow their own food make their own energy and converting their waste into local businesses that provide them the ability to make the things they need and use. Uh, this in environment of dependence only breeds abuse, corruption, and cronyism. The only way to address it is to literally teach the next generation on how to make these things for themselves and more, most importantly, build intentional communities. Portland's struggling right now with everything, and, you know, Seattle is trying to, um, you know, they're trying to advance and move forward. And really what I've come to understand is that whether it's a small village in Alaska or the Yucatan Peninsula or a big city like Chicago or Portland, cities and communities are made up of people. People make them what they are. So when it comes to making change, what really needs to occur is this dynamic shift in people's behaviors about not accepting this is the best it can do, but accepting this is the way things are today, but it's not going to be the way things are tomorrow. That makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, so you're up in Alaska, and this seems like a place that has you know, a good amount of natural resources available. Um, it also seems like a place that a lot of people go um, to kind of create 
you know, off grid living and off grid homes and things like that, especially like people who are going out in the wilderness, you know, I, I was just kind of curious, like with what you've done with, you know, your work with communities and people out there, how has it been received? You know, are, are a lot of people interested in going green and sustainability or do you see a lot of people kind of still clinging on to the fossil fuel use and, um, you know, these older, basically older mechanisms for, you know, harnessing energy and kind of more of a, uh, you know, less community atmosphere, but more just like rugged individualism? Well, uh, in many senses, people come to Alaska to be left alone. And right now, if we want to be left alone, we have to find a way to work together. And, and food is obviously the, the common ground because Alaska imports 95% of our food. And with our short growing seasons, it's simply not practical to be able to provide all of the food for everybody's needs just growing outside. In addition, to do so would require us to take over land that doesn't belong to us. And I'm not talking about the indigenous cultures that we've raped and pillaged, but the natural world that has just as much right to live here as we do. And we and, and very few of us even acknowledge the rights of the planet to exist independent from us, you know? So that's one of the reasons that I've been focusing on these in-game solutions, you know? I don't, I don't participate in food bank drives because I'm trying to find solutions to, you know, ending the need for food banks. And that really goes to feeding people. But there's this air of dependence. You know, every year we do this may no child left behind up here. And it's great. We definitely need people helping out. But the fact is, at what point do you start shifting from um, dependence and consumption to production and independence? I mean, none of these food banks have yet started promoting folks um, to grow their own food. And this, to answer your question about how this is receptive, the, the ideas are very receptive until it challenges the old guard. Uh, the younger generation is far more accept, uh, accepting of this because they recognize that this isn't going to last. But it's the older generation, it's the ones that are currently in positions of authority and influence that are like, well, we just, we've got coal, coal worked for us in the past, this is our economy, you know, we just got to live with it. And if you don't like it, leave Alaska. And unfortunately, there is a group out there that ha that's weighing their influence to to push that Alaska is that Alaska's environmental policy is drill, baby, drill. And if you don't like it, you can leave. Well, that's not how I see things. I, I believe that this is the the most beautiful place on on the planet, most one of the few remaining wild places on the planet. And at the top of the world, it's changing faster. It's changing twice as fast as the rest of the world. So the things that we can do here can have a huge implication. The small population in the large geographic area give us the opportunity to be a case study to show how if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere. And I know that back to the uh, issue of, you know, communities make, are made up of people. You know, I know the people in Alaska were able to pull together um, in three years the longest pipeline across uh, a state that people thought it could never be done. So we can do this stuff. It's just getting people educated and showing them how we can do it. And shows like this um, are really really a staple and i appreciate that uh, 2020 has helped open people's eyes and i think now we're trying to in the process of redefining who we are as a species and as individuals so when it comes to defining ourselves as individuals and in a collective shifting uh thought paradigms and uh defining community overall i understand that one of the cornerstones of arc and your overall mission is to facilitate a space where people can consciously collaborate uh, feel welcomed and validated and supported in their efforts to obtain these these things that you're setting forth. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, our, the most precious resource this planet has is the people that live here. Their, their innovation and investing in that is critical to our survival. And the first step to that is creating a safe space where people can feel like they can make mistakes. You know, our corporate world doesn't, doesn't record... Uh, um, appreciate or reward people for experimenting and failing you know uh, when we should be we should feel comfortable to fail greatly and learn from that so we can move on and that's the first thing that we try to do arc was created as a form to help those who are already trying to be the change in the world with resources and skills and more 
and more help so they can do it better. And there's a lot of people out there that are trying to make the world a better place in small ways. And we basically are trying to create the, the support system that allows them to take that to the next level. There's so many good organizations out there, but they spend most of their time just trying to survive. There's a lot of good people out there, but they spend most of their time just trying to survive. And it's all, it all boils back down to this, this um, rat race for money. And on the note of a lot of good people out there, um, and again, going back to the, de the definition of individualism and uh, collectivism and community, I myself found a lot of people are, um, well, they base their identity on things like honor, respect, uh, collaboration to some degree, but it's all within the boundaries of the monetary system, obviously. Um, I just ran across an individual the other day whom struck me as a very uh, endearing person, um, would give you the shirt off their back type person. But unfortunately, their definition of uh, community and collaboration is restricted to whatever fits into the ism that they've been brought up to believe in. So it just sounds to me like what you're trying to do is make sure that the people who participate on the ground level, they already have some type of understanding um, as to a, a diverse collaboration and uh, collaboration outside of the system versus only collaborating with people who are part of the niche that you're familiar and comfortable with. Yeah, that's been a, a real challenge to break uh, to help people break their paradigms. And this is one of the reasons that I uh, really advocate travel for folks. And one of the reasons that we've been talking about setting up training centers for permaculture professionals in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And then instead of like a local community college, if you signed up for a local community college in Fairbanks, then you would spend your first six months in the DR. You know, that, that radical perception shift is the, is the most effective way I've seen to break those cultural isms, you know, because once you move out of a region, you find out how those isms are no longer universal as you were led to believe. Yeah, travel, I think, is, is, is one of the most ultimate medicines in this world to actually see this world, to see the variety and the density of human life in, in all its forms. And I think so many people are just trapped you know, if they're in, if they grew up in a place like Alaska, or you know, I'm working on this coal coal mining documentary in Eastern Kentucky, and it's like there's so many beautiful people, like Amanda's talking about. They give you the shirt off their back, but they're fundamentally fundamentally limited in their understanding of the world because they just haven't been able to experience it. And that's a big part of the tethers of this rat race that keeps people locked into survival. That keeps people you know, so limited in what they can do because it's what they're limited in what they can imagine because they, they just can't leave. They can't get, they can't get far away from their family, their homes. Everything is so uh, fragile and it's so close to falling apart or falling through the cracks any minute that the notion of like just moving through the world, you know, without a strict objective, the, the notion of drifting like a seed on the wind and, and, you know, trying to find a place where you belong in a, in a way or just to experience this earth, this beautiful place that, you know, we are all citizens of in a way. And then that's not to espouse any sort of ownership that, you know, a lot of colonists feel or tourists. Uh, I've seen a lot of tourists like in Guatemala, there were these, you know, Western tourists that really felt like, oh, this is my land. I belong here when they were just being, you know, fundamentally exploiting the indigenous peoples that lived there. And, and, and they had, they were confined to a position of slavery where, where they couldn't leave or even appreciate their own country. But we are all citizens of this earth. And I think the answers, as the answers to our problems lie in nature, I think the answers to our human problems and our limitations, they lie elsewhere in the world. That for every problem we're experiencing, somebody elsewhere in the world has fixed it. And I think encouraging more travel, more exploration, and more general global humanness not more international trade, but more human connection. Another thing that I kind of wanted to ask Robert about, and I think I know he's had some experience with in the past, is working on, uh, you know, helping some of these local communities up in Alaska, you know, implement some of these solutions as well. I was wondering if you might be able to tell us more about, um, you know, some of the changes, you know, that people have been receptive to, you know, some of the projects that you've been working on. I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so the projects that I'm involved in are strategic campaigns to help communities build capacity, and it's centered around food. And so the 
The notion is that the more groups that can develop their own food security, the more better off they're able to resist in changing climates. So a lot of the communities in Alaska are facing rapid change, um, and they are now uh, looking at how they can um, adapt. Some of them are looking to become leaders. Others are just looking to maintain their existing way of life without much changes. So some of the some of the coastal communities literally are falling into the sea, and so the the federal government's invested millions of dollars in relocating some of these villages. It's been this, it's been devastating to me to basically see all this money spent to relocate these villages and not fix any problem. Because of our because of our leadership's lack of foresight where they thought the oil was just going to keep running forever, we've got nearly 220 villages that do not have a community. They're basically remote village or remote bedroom communities. And so people have to leave the community to get jobs. And that's why there's losing culture. And then when they come back, they've got nothing to do except get drunk. And that creates a whole bunch of other problems. And so the uh, more and more communities are looking to develop local economies. And food is a driver for local economies um, because to achieve food sovereignty, you have to look at not just the growing of food, but you have to look at where it's being consumed. What's the distribution plans? What's the storage? What kind of processing do you have? And so it, that's why food seems to be a key component, not only to community and culture, but to driving these local living economies that set people free from the dependence and this um, poverty addiction. I, I want to sort of shift gears, gears and broaden out a little bit here to sort of incorporate uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about and, and to sort of specifically piggyback off of food to talk about an idea that for me was one of the most magical discoveries that I've ever uh, experienced in my travels. It's something, it's like one of those holy grail things that it's like, holy shit, this is it. This is the end game solution. This is one of the most fundamental and powerful forces on earth. It, it's permaculture. And that, that's not a, an idea that just relates to food. It's an overall philosophy of life. And I feel like you you'll be able to define it in a much more profound way than I am because I, I'm not a grower, I'm not a cultivator. I'm a cultivator of, of human connections and things like that. Who you who you ask that question to, you're you're likely to get a different answer. But to my understanding, permaculture is simply the process of designing um, a civilization that endures. Um, Matt was kind enough to introduce me as an ecological industrialist, and what I and what I mean by that is someone who takes nature and looks at how that can be utilized as a business model for humanity to thrive, and make and reconnect with nature, which is the main issue we have right now, is we're disconnected with nature, so we're disconnected with ourselves, we're disconnected with each other, and that makes us extremely vulnerable to this cultural conditioning, to commercials, to um, all of this pressure to buy stuff, to, to uh, derive some kind of sense of satisfaction and spiritual nourishment from the stuff you own. And as we've discovered, and as the younger generation is discovering, the more stuff you own, the more your stuff owns you. And they're starting to make this shift naturally from wanting to consume life to experience and share it. That's why so many of these groups, who you, even the people who can't afford to stay in homes, are abandoning their, their sedentary lifestyles and buying RVs and joining these intentional communities and, and traveling and seeing and, and getting more experience about what the world's really like rather than what their Facebook groups and their Instagrams and CNN tells them the world is like. We fundamentally lack a primacy and a, a – you know, for lack of a better word, a culture. We don't have culture. Culture as like curds forming together. Culture is something bubbling, forming, you know, something that has roots, something that is dense and rich and powerful, something that sustains us, something that brings us together, something that holds us together. We have these frail senses of ourselves, these frail identities that are based on nothing as substantial as 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 nature itself, but as, but on the things that we buy, the things that we ex consume. That's, I think, a, a central tenet of permaculture as a life philosophy is the creation of systems of systems, of living systems that stack functions, that don't create waste, that that are imminently interwoven into this beautiful fabric that all enriches each other instead of this is my house and this is my family and this is me as a separate thing it's all of these people coming together and actually living their lives in a way that they are all feeding into each other and creating community creating culture creating something permanent something that will outlive us that's that's an amazing thing about so many of these indigenous cultures 
that they didn't feel the need to build these big stone monuments. They didn't feel the need to build all of these big uh, aggrandized statements that said, I am here. Yet they created these cultures that we still revere today, that we still dig into and read about with, with awe because they, they created something that is so powerful and beautiful with the and, materials and that's really of life. where, you know, permaculture meets the, the road of modern civilization is that, you know, m most of our problems um, stem from the fact that our spirits, our lives, our world is disconnected from the natural world we live in, and permaculture offers us a way back. Um, I see permaculture as kind of like the Rosetta Stone of indigenous wisdom, and I think that the culture of America really is the blending of all these global cultures. You know, I think that is what really sets us apart from the rest of the world and something we should embrace. That's why I prefer Kwanzaa over Christmas. You know, it's about diversity and I think that's the spice of life and I think that's what really makes us stronger. And when permaculture is basically using the models that nature gives us to have a high quality of life with a low cost of living, that you know, so I saw somebody, uh, a meme, I think it was maybe on the Money the Society page where somebody was, it was a picture of a deer, and they were like, well, I don't need money to survive. Why do you? You know, and I think that it's basically a shift from trying to have everything for me beyond what I need and trying to get as much as I want at the sacrifice of other people. And I think that's where, you know, where uh, the next generation is, is shifting. They're not seeing that they need to have these big houses and these big cars to be happy. What they need is they need friends. They need real experience. They need to be able to eat real food and have clean air. So that's why I focus on food, not as um, the goal or the end game, but as the door to opening up all of to opening people's minds to the world they live in and to the potential of the world we can create by growing and nurturing not only gardens, but those around us. And that's exactly what uh, permaculture tends to um, cultivate. Um, collectively, with the studies of Marshall Celine and Margaret Mead, and I believe it's Gerald Gertz, basically what has been proven through their observations is the fact that in indigenous cultures where acquisition isn't the prime motive, rather sustainability and survival is, um, and those things in their true context, not artificially driven. Um, people, people are just, they organically culture, uh, you know, um, social interaction and healthy relationships because it's based on organic things, not artificial things, things that are constructed to stand in between uh, humans and survival. When the integrity of an ecosystem is based on all of its component parts thriving together, the end result is happiness. Happiness is built into it, and it's a necessary, it's a prerequisite for that system to thrive. There, you can't leave one piece out. Like, like in our society, we can't leave out the working class. We can't leave out indigenous people. We can't leave out black and indigenous populations. We can't leave out one group of people and have a healthy society. It's like you can't neglect one aspect of a living system and expect it to thrive. And this may be a bit of a tangent, but it's just a way of thinking about money that I have developed recently or have come to that has bubbled out of me, it is not intuitive. It's not natural. It's not something that that is inherently human. It, it's not. It's a maladaptive technology that uh, separates us from our connection to nature, that humans evolved because we were social, we were communal, we were able to uh, work together and to put the needs of many over the needs of one and form these symbiotic connections, not just with other humans, but like what Robert was saying earlier, with the, with the, the beauty of nature, with all of these plants, with all of these animals, with all of these other species that we are in, interconnected with completely, that we are interdependent on. And money is this maladaptive parasite that basically makes it so you don't need anyone. You don't need to like people. You don't need to be liked by people. You don't need other people to live. You just have this technology, this convenient, ultimately commodified uh, simplification of life that you can say, that you can give to somebody to say, okay, meet my needs for me. And it, it keeps people cut off from that nature. It's unnatural and it, it's a technology. It's not something, we shouldn't think about it as something that is, uh, you know, in, that it is like this inevitable evolution that we need to it work actually up beyond. Leads us it's right a maladaption. It's why I created and have been advocating the Butterfly Initiative because we can't leave anybody behind. Where we can, we, 
it's not a matter of leaving people behind. It's a matter of giving them the choice to cross the bridge. You know, every civilization faces this gap. You know, when some when we, something happens and we either adapt to overcome it or we fall back into our base instincts and then we have to try again. And what we've been working on and what the Butterfly Initiative represents is basically a bridge for everyone to cross that gets us from this consumption and corruption and dependence and helps us move strategically back towards um, holistic, interdependent, authentic interactions. And that's why, you know, I've been advocating it as a way to help all organizations. My organization, ARC, has launched the Butterfly Initiative as a way to bring other organizations to the table to discuss um, how we can invest in infrastructure without taxing people, uh, how we can invest in people without taxing our environment, how we can invest in a brighter future without having to sacrifice what we have now. So I'm curious, can you tell us more about what exactly the Butterfly Initiative is? Sure. So there are three different types of butterfly initiatives. Uh, one is a, a, a nonprofit that helps um, underserved women. Another one is one that works on uh, bullying. And then the one we've created is basically a uh, – it's basically an infrastructure plan that works with private equity investors that doesn't rely on the government to help people become um, self-reliant and building communities that are, you know, thriving and resilient to to these changes. And so it's based basically on programs that are already work. And it is basically an alignment of existing systems to cross that bridge. So, so everybody, regardless of where they're at, can actually see the value and make that shift for themselves, so that they, um, um, so they know where um, where they're going to be able to go. Because not everybody can take those, you know, those huge leaps of faith. So the Butterfly Initiative is basically was designed as a 10-year transition plan that consists of five parts that, ex that represent organizations and efforts that are already ongoing. And the first step is the LEAP, which is the rep refers to the LEAP Manifesto out of, out of Canada. And that's in a transition phase. But the essence there is that it's an acknowledgement that we live with the earth and not on it that we don't live on a rock, that we coexist with a symbiotic relationship and our knowledge and wisdom give us the power to change and therefore we accept the power of stewardship. That's the stewardship pledge for ARC. And the idea with the leap is people to take that leap of faith and accepting that we are part of the planet and not just on it. Now, this may sound crazy to, to BIPOC people or an indigenous people who already recognize that, yeah, we're part of the system, but for a lot of the consumer consult, um, a lot of the American culture, that's not the case. Unfortunately, generations of cultural conditioning have, uh, have led us to believe that the environment is something separate from us something that we need to dominate and control. And that's given us the world we live in today. Uh, without bringing religion into this conversation, the context of spirituality and connecting with the planet helps us connect with ourselves and each other. And food, even growing a simple plant in your window, um, some, not just even a, a flower, those kind of things connect us by nurturing life. And it really helps move us in a direction where we can connect with each other. And that's why we advocate mainly food projects. Um, but just a real quick finish up with the – so once people take the leap and recognize they're part of the system, we give them the tools to, met, to set up the metrics – on what they determine for happiness for themselves. Um, I've had a lot of challenges with the communitarianism approach where, you know, individuals should sacrifice themselves for the good of the community. And I really think that if we educate people, individuals will see that the good of the community is also the good for them because it's that nurturing that allows them to thrive. I, I don't like this dynamic, this, this uh, conflict between the individual and community. Just like the conflict between society and, um, you know, groups, we're all part of the same organism. And with patience and understanding, we can um, find a way to work together. And that leads us to um, basically, so the, the, the sec second step is called Eco Districts. And it's an organization based out of Portland that helps communities develop a business plan. 
it can ha it can be some somewhat restrictive some for some folks, but it doesn't necessarily have you don't have to go through the whole process. By comparison, the third step is actually the transition town network, and that's basically where groups are sharing their stories with each other and learning from each other in an organic fashion, where there's no um, real rigid command structure or anything like that. And then this leads people to understanding that the economy exist within a living system called the blue planet. So it gets them thinking about global economies and their local impacts on it, which takes us to our, our favorite subject, the resource-based economy. And this opens up the door for our children to learn what life will be like when we're able to thrive beyond our monetary constraints. So those are the five steps of the initiative. So I was just gonna say today, I was reading today, uh, John Kerry came out and said some bullshit about how you know, 50% of our emissions reduction is going to come from new technologies, really just parroting Bill Gates' stupid line. And it's just, I, I, I really raged at that. It made me grind my teeth because it's so completely wrong. And I, I, I kind of went into a rabbit hole there and I was reading all these papers and articles and things like that about how we don't actually need to increase energy consumption or we don't even need to meet our current energy com consumption needs to keep our quality of life in, increasing or current. We don't need to keep uh, expanding and increasing them. And that's something that is totally taken for granted by all sort of, you know, establishment technocrats that we need to expand, we need to keep growing, when in reality, the solutions are to use more with less that we, we live in incredibly wasteful societies, so much of our energy is just pure fucking waste. I mean, it, it, I don't really feel like I even need to evoke that many explanations of it. I mean, it's just so clear how wasteful we are. That so much of what we do, I mean, to, to speak to one one pertinent example to keep it in the, the sort of ballpark of food, I mean, these these supply chains, these massive supply chains, I saw this picture on the internet, it was like, it was a, a fruit cup, you know, those shitty little fruit cups that you get in, in a, you know, kid's school cafeteria or a prison. <laughs> same food, same, same shit. So it said, uh, it said like grown in Argentina, uh, packaged in Thailand. So it's like, they grew it in Argentina, shipped it all the way to the other side of the country or the world, the globe, and then they shipped it all the way back to Canada or the United States or wherever the picture was taken. And it's like, that is so incredibly wasteful and stupid. And it's like, we don't need to decrease our quality of life to maintain a sustainable ecosystem. We can optimize everything to give everyone a better quality of life so that everyone is working less, living longer, living healthier. Our efficient, quotes, air quotes, a uh, food system that is completely devoid of nutritional content because monocropping has overstripped our topsoil and taken away all the micronutritional content from our food and has essentially made it poison because it requires all these pesticidal in, in, uh, inputs to get, just to keep growing it. it it's, it's completely retrograde to our needs and to our health. One thing that intrigued me that Robert said is one of the first steps for building these types of systems is to come up with a business plan for the community right? Not just for an individual or for a few people or something, but essentially a business, a business plan for an entire community, uh, you know, that they can follow and work together on essentially like in a, it sounds like what you're talking about is almost kind of like a cooperative for the community. Would I be, would I be wrong in stating that? Or, or are these structures kind of like cooperatives? And um, also, what does that look like, essentially? What does is, what is a business plan for a community look like? How far have you gotten down the line uh, with, with an actual community with what you're talking about? And what does that look like? You guys asked some complicated questions. I'll try to, to get into uh, all the answer everything here. Um, so the Butterfly Initiative is, is accumulation of the work that I've been doing for the last 22 years, finding out where we might be able to find in-game solutions to these challenges. And that's why energy, food, and waste are, are key components to unlocking the potential. Food is the common denominator because everybody eats, and it's a way to be able to connect people to the conversation of permaculture. It also gets people thinking about waste, and especially when they start thinking about the, the inputs that go into the food products that they're feeding their children as opposed to to real food so there's a real power in getting people to garden or to grow their own food and even if they don't then there's people out there that like to do it that are willing to do it as a, as a business a lot of people especially those who want to see us move beyond money 
have seen mon money and business and corporations as the, you know, the epitome to community. But really, they're just other ways that we choose to organize ourselves. So whether it's the Green Bay Packers common common stock ownership model, whether it's the fair shares commons initiative model or co-op, you know, these are all different organizational structures for us to manage the resources we have. Yeah, that's super cool. And um, as far as like the business plans for the community, so how, how is a fair share uh, corporation or, or, or business structure different from a cooperative? Because I know you're saying you're having some issues with the cooperative structure. Um, and I've heard a little bit about those fair share uh, types of business structures. Can you elaborate on that exactly and tell us a little bit more about the fair share type of business structure and how that differentiates from your standard cooperative? Sure. Well, I can in, I can give you a brief introduction. If people are really interested in learning about the fair shares economics model, then I would refer them to Graham Boyd's book, uh, Rebuild. But essentially, fair share economics looks at everybody as part of an ecosystem, your suppliers, your vendors, your employees, and that the more you're able to integrate them into the decision-making process, the more you're able to empower them to make your company work because your company just doesn't work for yourself. It works for everybody in the in the community as well as other corporations. And that's the kind of community building that we find if we were all stranded on an island. You know, we would look for how we could work together um, and share those resources to do more than we could do our, ourselves. Um, and that's what we've been trying to accomplish. And, and frankly, it has been it has been quite challenging, especially with working with uh, the, some of the rural communities because of the need to uh, get the village the corporation and the tribal council all on the same page and all signing the same documents. And, and these have been, you know, these are communities that are several hundred miles away from each other. So the pandemic hasn't helped, but we are starting to, um, we've got a, com a couple of communities that we are in active negotiations with on doing permaculture projects um, around hemp, around green buildings, and ultimately around food as the keystone for local living economies. Um, we're hoping that these case studies will be able to um, demonstrate what's already going on out there with the global eco-village network and transition towns. I mean, these things are already happening. We're trying to mainstream them so that the people who are suffering can benefit from them. And so that's why we came up with these models for vertical farms, which basically serve as mixed-use uh, mixed use commercial developments that we can take into small towns and big cities alike and use to create these food systems which start developing this infrastructure for local living economies. And so that's where, and like I said, a decade ago, people were laughing at these ideas. Now they're all scrambling to try to be able to figure out how to do them themselves. So 2020 has been eye-opening for a lot of people and where um, I, I kind of feel like I've been Rudolph and now it's all foggy and everybody's calling looking for solutions. So <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be grateful for the opportunities and, and humble to move forward. Um, if I could point out one thing that I think would raise a concern uh, in secular society. And, and when I say concern, that more so means a, a criticism. Um, and listening to what you're saying and taking into account that obviously we can't make any of these things go, come to fruition without monetary, uh, without a monetary aspect. At what point do we wean off of these monetary infrastructures that you're proposing and transition into, um, you know, a non-monetary sustainable model? I guess what I'm saying is uh, it, it seems like there could be a potential for these, uh, these designs to just further perpetrate the monetary system. So, so where, where's, where's that switch in the track? Well, um, Amanda, you actually pointed out very specifically when you used the word secular. So what I'd like to, to answer that question by reading a very, very brief quote from the Celestine Prophecy. And it comes from um, the back part of this, uh, the ability to have a synchronistic lifestyle. If synchronicity exists, secular delusion falls apart. It's as simple as that. That's why synchronicity is so important. And so the the tipping point is when individuals start recognizing and focusing on beauty and seeing the beauty in the world around them. And then that starts opening their minds and their eyes to synchronicities and how connected they are to the world. And once you get connected, it's like once you let your brain out of the box, it'll never fit back in. 
So moving from moving from secularism to um, synchronicities and connection and communities, these are the energy forces that move our attention to align with a universal flow of energy that can only go up. It's like it, when you when you bring your brain out of the box, like you eloquently said. I mean, and you just acknowledge fundamentally from a from a, a very deep place that the world is meaningful, that all of this is purposeful and intentional and connected, things get freaky. You know, the, things, things start coming together way, way more quickly and powerfully than you could ever design them. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's the force that, that binds together permaculture. It's the, fir, it's the force that, that uh, makes the forests come together out of nothingness, you know, out of one speck, out of one seed. It, it, it changes the world and it opens it up. I think when you travel through the world, and you, you are stripped away from your routines, you start to see how purposeful everything is, how magical things are, how there's this sort of shimmering veneer of meaning in everything in our world that when you, when you stop training your perspective, squeezing it into seeing only uh, the, the lines on the road ahead of you on your way to work, you start to see this, this, this vast realm of possibilities and potentialities and this beautiful connection that you are not the only one on that road that there are many, many other people that are just like you starting to notice this world, this other world that's been here the whole time. And I think that is the shift that needs to happen in people is to shift out of this. This is the way things are. This is the way things go. This, this uh, really reductive sense of, of business and politics that is just keeping us from seeing what is right before us. The, the, the vast potential, the vast possibility that this world embodies in, in all of its, in every leaf of every tree. Yeah. And you, you hit on the main reward about why I love serving so much, because that's the reward is when I see people's eyes light up to new possibilities. When people realize that there's something they can do, that the world is actually, there's hope for the world. Those kind of little things are greater than any monetary value. Uh, and knowing that they're going to be okay because they are now aware and awake and they can take action. Um, you know, there's so many beautiful people in this world and they're just, they're afraid to wake up because they don't feel like they have the nurturing culture to be able to be their authentic self. And that's why I very much appreciate the work that all of you guys are doing in, with the Moneyless Society is to create those kind of safe spaces for folks to be able to I, I figure out what does it mean to be your authentic self and then to find a uh, find a group that's not trying to make you like them but that is celebrating your unique diversity i can give a bit of a testimony to the the concept of waking up per se and and finding yourself in an environment that nurtures who you organically are it's out there people are out there that do agree with you and resonate with you and will support you in these decisions that you feel tugging at you uh, whether it's your instincts or your heart or whatever your conscious I recently moved to an eco village slash urban agricultural district. And it was the best thing I've ever done. And I wish I had done it 20 years earlier. And um, it took me the past 20 years to water my own garden and, uh, and not care who else was trying to stomp on it or pull me up like I was a weed, so to speak. Uh, it took those past 20 years to realize that I had a worthy contribution and just because it wasn't defined by the corporate world did not make it uh, unvaluable. Um, and so here I am finally 20 years later in an environment where I can finally breathe, my chest isn't heavy, I don't feel con uh, continuously inundated with uh, ridiculous expectations that do nothing but uphold the artificial hierarchy and the status quo and uh, you know all that jazz. Uh, and so living in this community, uh, a little bit about what it looks like, there's gardens on I should say greenhouses on every corner, gardens in every backyard, hydroponics, vertical farms, you name it, it's here. And the sense of community is unparalleled to anything I've ever experienced. I, I just am so incredibly grateful that I am finally in a place where my contributions and my mindset are going to make uh, a difference. And I'm, I'm actually going to get some traction. Uh, so, so yeah, permaculture, again, that's where it starts. I believe that is really the ground floor of setting the stage for the consciousness, the conscious environment that needs to be cultivated in order for people to step out of the box and into a place where, where you're comfortable and strong enough to, to work together and make these things actually happen. Once again, Amanda, you're selling yourself short. I mean, that's not a small thing at all. 
one person finding their way out of the meat grinder is enormous. I mean, that, that, that one person could be an Einstein. They could be a Buckminster Fuller. That one person could and absolutely does. Every single one of us does have something vital to contribute to this web of life. We have something vital to contribute to consciousness that we are not meant to live these lives where we spend so much of our potential and energy just grinding away at something arbitrary, something that is literally killing the world. I mean, why is, why is that normal? Why is that okay? Why is it okay for one person, for one single person to live like that? I mean, this may, this may be a trivial point, but uh, I was on a, in a, on a crazy shoot last night. I, I had this weird opportunity to film in a, in a, a historically black Masonic temple last night. And we were trying to find food in this area. And it was like a total food desert. And we went to all these restaurants and they were all closed down. And we, the only option was like fast food. And I abhor fast food. It's like, it's like a last, absolute last resort. And we, we waited in line for like 20 minutes. It was like the most inconvenient thing imaginable just to get food in this, in this food desert, this concrete wasteland. It was just so inefficient and so wrong. And we finally got this food and it was like, it, it was anti-food. It, it like sapped my energy. It made me feel terrible. It was just so clearly like awful and wrong. And like, just, it's just torture chicken, you know, like the chicken, like every, I believe cooking is an act of infusing food with an intention. Like every intentional act is an act of magic. And that, that's what changes the world and opens up the web of synchronicity. But w when somebody is in a kitchen and they are uh, pouring the intention, fuck this, I hate this. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I, I want to go home. I want to I want to numb my consciousness to the soul experience that is being infused into the food. And then we eat that. And the food itself, like if it's an animal, its whole life is suffering and pain and misery. And it's like to be able to, to eat that, to eat that food, to have it where you don't have access to the life-giving nutrients of this world. And you can't do that. And it's, already, it's not even fast. It's not even convenient. It's not even good. It's, it's, just, it's just wrong in every single way. And it's like these are the small atrocities, these small moments that, that sap our will to live and our power, our existence, our ability to uh, just gain one inch of ground above this concrete soup that we are all sinking into. These are tragedies. These are atrocities, and they are the unspoken and un unremarked on atrocities of our time that are so manifold. There are so many of them that happen so many times a day to so many people. We cannot fathom how limited we are. We cannot fathom how unhealthy this way of life is and how truly profound eating a, a, a good bowl of, of food, eating, eating a plate of food that is grown uh, with, with nutrients and with health and with a positive intention to make this world a better place. That is huge. And what's most amusing to me is obviously how incredibly, I mean, if not indescribably, inefficient and unnecessary all these extra steps are to get a bowl of food in front of you. And it's all just to support the monetary system and the people with the power, with the money. And of course, what I've just said is incredibly summed up, uh, generalized and uh, baseline. But I feel like sometimes my job is to make those baseline statements because as hard as it is to wrap your head around, there are still so many, so many people, like millions, hundreds of millions of people out there who still have no concept of the fact that there are options and there are other ways to go about life. Well, and that's where food becomes uh, such a, you know, not to harp on the food subject, but that's where it becomes such a critical point of healing is it, it gives us the opportunity to to nurture life and we start nurturing life in ourselves. You know, Zach, you pointed out exactly why we need to be doing this kind of stuff because people need alternatives. I mean, you talk about the, you know, if we're not investing in people, then we're not seeing their potential. And I feel like we could have generations of Einsteins and Picassos and, and Carl Sagan's and stuff like that, but we don't have that kind of society. And that's where we need to shift to. Uh, and that's why food is so important because food removes money. It moves us back to a simple barter system, a simple sharing system. And again, this is not the in-game solution, but this is the catalyst for us to recognize that we can make changes in uh, small changes that add up really quickly to a larger uh, shift in our society. And that's why what we're focusing on um, is this goal that we're trying to encourage each, set, say, um, each state to set and that is basically the goal of 80% food sovereignty. Um, it creates this critical shift of, of perception on how we go about our food systems and the impacts it has on carbon and all that kind of other stuff. 
I, I kind of want to shift gears here. And um, it, it's reminded me of another Buckminster Fuller sort of uh, idea. And um, it's, it's basically that uh, politics is, is uh, models of, of change that seek political channels to change the individual, to change the law, to make this happen are ultimate, they, they pale in comparison to the true solutions of redesigning and engineering society to create good people, to create uh, conditions and environments where people just naturally thrive, where you don't need people to be ruled, you don't need people to be told what to do. Every person in society, the highest good of society is to educate them, is to make them healthy, is to make good people to invest in our ultimate resource, which is humanity, which is th to foster uh, to get people to the point where we're all having these conversations on a much higher level than just where do you want to eat? What do you want to eat? You know, how do we get food? This, th this, this most simple and fundamental thing in life of, of, of meeting our most basic needs, that we are beyond that, that that is the, the bottom line. Uh, I, I was reading uh, recently that the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he was talking about the, um, I think maybe the Iroquois or another of, of the First Nations, and he was saying their hierarchy of needs like meeting those needs, it's not even on the pyramid. Like it's such, they say they so take it for granted that everybody's needs are met, that food is taken care of, that housing is taken care of, that it's not even on their pyramid to, to, to question that. So I kind of want to shift gears to the macrocosm, to the big picture and, and talk about uh, a resource-based economy or a new vision or uh, what we could do without all of these steps in our way. What, what is the potential that we possess right now? Well, right now, we have the potential to become a carbon negative society by recognizing that we can turn our fuel and our energy project or energy sources into building materials. And that's where we're shifting to to keep Bucky in the in the picture. You know, that's where we're shifting it now. And it's a great time to introduce the 2150 project where over the next 50 years, we're looking to build 21 completely sustainable uh, sustainable cities and to build them out of 3D printed construction debris. So we can provide housing, provide food, and clean up the environment at the same time while building these new cities. The challenge of which of why I'm in Alaska is because the, the political environment actually is conducive to this kind of bold thinking. You know, in the lower 48, there's so many requirements, there's so many permits to just even to make a modification to your house. But here we have the freedom and the luxury. We've been actually offered by a, um, by a native corporation 160 acres to build an intentional community from the ground up so we can demonstrate how to get it right and use that um, to, to develop um, local living economies based around geotourism, where people are there to absorb the community rather than there to kill things. And so these are part of our economic shift that we're looking at as part of the initiative and using Alaska as a baseline for the rest of the world. We can over, we can skip a lot of the challenges that the traditional uh, lower 48 went through um, by advancing, by investing in advanced technologies rather than trying to just make marginal changes like in bringing up natural gas, which the rest of the world's trying to get rid of. If I might ask a question, um in relation to your carbon sequestration um, ventures with the X Prize, but I am so curious as to what motivated you to participate in the X Prize competition, uh, considering how polarized the RBE sector, you could say, is from personalities, figureheads like Elon Musk and his aims and proposals to take uh, human life to another planet. <laughs> well, I actually think that the, you know, aerospace is what has given us the environmental movement. And I think that these explorations for how we might build life on another planet actually give us the perspective on how precious life is on this planet and encourages us to be better stewards. The efforts that we're putting together to to print three to print these cities is exactly the same, same kind of technology they're looking at building colonies on Mars. But except for here, we can use our trash to house people and to train them in these new careers so that you know we can explore new horizons. At the same time, we can help regrow this planet into a thriving living Eden. Um, because when, as we go out in the space, we're going to find how precious this one planet is. And I think that's uh, all of this has to be critically and carefully managed because it can be so easily corrupted. I just I just feel like I have to kind of uh, touch on that point of, of Elon Musk and his absolutely hideous uh, notion of leaving Earth like a 
like <laughs> like he's like he's he's there's this he's like the 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 deadbeat dad who's going to leave his pregnant wife you know <laughs> to go gamble or something on the on the most ludicrous idea of a human being has ever come up with i mean i i wanted i'm writing i'm writing a big uh, elaborate essay about this uh, about this phenomenon and everything but when i was a child i was really really fixated on the idea of being like the first man on mars and i'm sure my my dad thought that was really cute you know that's like the kind of thing you you, you know there's a little picture of me on mars or whatever on the fridge but when the richest man in the world states that as his goal that he is massively consolidating wealth on this planet in 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 uh measures that have never been assembled before in in an, a, amounts of sheer wealth that are the wealth of nations that are that are systems level wealth when that is the person who is saying we're going to go to mars and we're going to go uh you know populate a complete wasteland because we fucked ours up because of these these false malthusian notions of overpopulation and and just the, this baked in acceptance they are accepting that the earth is going to die they are accepting that climate change is going to irrevo irrevocably alter and scar this planet without without doing everything possible without taking those resources which have been stripped from humanity in so many ways i mean he's got he's got basically slaves mining for the rare earth metals in his batteries i mean he he participated directly uh, or or at least indirectly in the the attempted coup attempt of bolivia somebody tweeted at him like hey why did you do that? And he said, we will coup whoever we want. I mean, when somebody with that level of power and influence has their sights set on leaving this earth behind, when they are doing actually very little to seriously transform this system and are in fact benefiting from it more than anyone to take its resources and its, its uh, wealth to engage in this, this idiotic moonshot to Mars, I just, I just have to call it out because it's absurd and it's fatalistic and it, it's that arrogance that is going to doom us more than anything that that these people who are not the smartest people on earth that don't have the answers that don't really understand our problems are the ones that we send all of our our wealth to that they, they we don't send it to they're taking it well i so beyond to to go to enter amanda's questions what kind of motivated me to get into this whole carbon capture stuff setting aside the the x prize i'll get back to that in a second but you know the fact is is that we've been in fairbanks we have a population under hundred thousand, and we have four coal plants and they were all built back in the 1950s except for the new one that the aerospace university and climate action university decided that they need to build and now we've got the the military base trying to build a new coal plant you know we i've watched advocates do the marching chain themselves to stuff and and do all that kind of stuff and at the end of the day nothing changes we get new coal plants so what really got me into this carbon capture was looking at a new strategy that def that devoided the, their argument of well you're going to cost us jobs or you're going to ruin the economy by focusing on a way to take these negative products and turn them into positive products that creates jobs that supports the environment and real and help people realize that these are our local resources and start to take them back from the corporations that pirate us i mean if um we have an obligation in our constitution to defend our country against the enemies foreign and domestic and i think corporations that have taken over our company are domestic terrorists and so that's why we have to um you know that's why we have to find strategies and stuff like that and and frankly um from my perspective it's a matter it's a matter of um picking your battles and the enemy of my enemy is my friend i do not think that elon's abandoning the planet by wanting to go to mars I, I, when you were talking, I kind of, I, I, I couldn't help but think back to the critics of the Wright brothers. You know, why are we investing in these plain things? You know, there's so many good trains and we've got housing and other stuff that we need to be investing in. And I totally agree. I definitely agree. We need to be investing in this planet in resolving these issues um, and simply view our, our efforts in space and aerospace as an application of our highest calling our highest intellect and our imagination, and most importantly, to give us the perspective of how precious and important this, this planet is. If it hadn't been for the Apollo 16 program, we would have never seen that picture of Earth without borders or without religions. And we would never, and it's very likely that the environmental movement may have taken a lot longer to get off the ground if it ever did. So I don't, I, I, rep, I respect your position. I definitely understand. We definitely need to be making investments into the people, into this planet. 
I simply see a, an investment in, in aerospace as a way to do that. Well, I, I think I think to not be uh, totally mis misunderstood, uh, uh, I think that space travel and the exploration of the cosmos, back to this that theme of travel, I mean, it's really one of our highest goods. It's one of our highest aims as a species. Eventually, this Earth is going to die. And I, I think if our species can uh, continue to exist in the next 100,000, 10,000 million years, whatever, I don't know how long our timeline is, we could be the species to bring life elsewhere in the cosmos. But it's a it's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of 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 just how out of touch you can be when, you know, it's like there's no billionaire out there who's like, I want to end poverty. You know, here's my crazy thing. I want to end poverty. They're, they're all, you know, more and more of them, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, two richest people in the world, their goals are space travel. And it's like they're I just can't help but see that as a, an attempt to escape as an attempt to run away from their problems because they have the ability to do that. They're the people on the Titanic that have the lifeboats. They've got a little motor, they're building a motorboat while everybody else is sinking. And I just think it's, it's so disrespectful and it's so profoundly grotesque an aim. And it's so out of touch with humanity that these people are doing nothing to really change our system, the system itself that is killing this planet. The system, which is the only thing really, because humans, humans inherently are not destructive. I mean, you look at all of the indigenous societies in the world, we can be the greatest stewards in the planet. I mean, the Amazon rainforest, there's evidence that it was cultivated, that the, the entire Amazon rainforest was, an, was a garden that was created by indigenous peoples. The human beings can be the ultimate stewards. We can increase biodiversity. We can foster evolution. We can grow and, and, and contribute immensely to this earth. But we can't do that if we're locked in this this system, this predatory, destructive, and parasitic system, that is the only thing keeping us from living amazing lives. So I, I can't, I can't, I have to call these people out. And it's not because of their aims. I mean, I think they're, they're fine aims. I think we, I think it's a, it's a romantic dream to go to the stars. I think it's beautiful. But in the context of this day and age and this time, I think it's despicable. Yeah. And I kind of feel the same way too. Like I'm, you know, I, I'm not against space exploration at all or anything, but when I see, uh, you know, a lot of resources and people getting hyped up to colonize Mars and I, I mean, I can't recall a lot of what I've read about it, but it seems just like an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Uh, not a very great idea all around. And, and, and when there's a lot of resources that are going into that and a lot of hype going into that, in my opinion, it's kind of just misdirected. Um, I, I mean, like I said, by all means, let's let's improve our space capabilities and, and you know, our our program to to explore the stars and go to other planets and things like that. Um, but let's also make really focus on home when we need to as well. You know, I mean, if this if this space exploration, if, if anything, honestly, I think I think um, working on space exploration for uh, asteroid mining would probably be one of the most productive uses of that technology to actually help us on Earth. I mean, if it's feasible, I, I, I don't know exactly how feasible it is or not, but I, I would assume it probably is, especially in the long term. I read that, uh, that, Jeff, that, that that's Jeff Bezos's, or one of his goals is to mine asteroids. And I just imagine an oligarch like that who already has basically owns the means of the means of production, who is using his, his accumulated resources to leverage, you know, incredible and ever increasing inequality against the human race. I just can't help but see something like that as a nightmarish conclusion. It's like, it's like the, the airplane, you know, the airplane, people thought that the airplane would end war because it would make it so horrible that we, we have the ability to just drop fire on people now, that they thought that the airplane would end war. They thought that dynamite would make war too horrible, that it wouldn't exist. And it's like all of these technologies that should make life on Earth a utopia, they make it more dangerous and destructive all the time. Stephen, Stephen Hawking summed it up really nicely. He said uh, something to the effect of it, it really just depends on who owns that technology. You know, if, if, the, if the technology is going to be owned by, you know, uh, greedy corporate billionaires that are, that are going to essentially hoard the wealth all for themselves, it's going to be a nightmarish dystopia. If the technology is commonly owned, you know, throughout the people and we share the wealth and we share the resources, then essentially we'll be headed towards a utopia. You know, it's, it's Steve is a commie. Awesome.
<laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I mean, and, and I resonate with that a lot too. You know, it's, it's kind of the equal ownership aspect of it, the sharing cooperative aspect of it versus the capitalist, you know, aspect of it. And it's, it, essentially who's going to develop that technology or, or if he, if, if the capitalists do develop it, will it end up in the hands of, you know, the collective uh, people as a whole? If we seize it. Eventually, you're right. Ex- exactly. If if it comes down to it, or I mean, or if it just you know through one, you know, mechanism or another, uh, if the old system is obsoleted, then those things will likely fall into the hands of the you know the cooperative community, essentially. So that's that's where I'm hoping things will end up eventually. But but it, it, like like you said, it could it could go either way. So it's we live in interesting times for sure. I've always found the best way to predict the future is to be the one writing the script. Thanks for that, Robert. And I am just latching on to something that Marlo said before uh, Matt just now. He pointed out how the human race is inherently destructive. And then you expounded on reasons why, and Matt followed that up nicely. And I'd like to tie that all together and associate it with a, with a quote that has become my favorite by far. Um, and it's a Jacques Cr- uh, Fresco quote, uh, we are a product of our environment. Uh, what I hear from everything that every one of you are saying is that um, it's just another point on how urgent it is to get out of this system. Uh, being a product of our environment, our feedback perpetuates the conditioning. So obviously, we're not going to you know, get into a collaborative environment that's sustainable and that is indefinite until we begin the transition. And so that's why we're all here, obviously, is to make those first steps as hard as it may be to do, whatever hurdles become in our way. Uh, that's why that's why we're all here talking about it. And this really is it brings us back to what we began this conversation with is and how do you manage the the negativity that's out there? You know, we have to uh, what I see Zach talking about is we have to hold the line. We got to keep these people accountable. We can't let them get away with what they're doing, and we can't certainly let them ex- let them believe that they can make it worse. But at the same time, we have to be able to have uh, teams out there that are working to make those old systems obsolete and to help usher people, give people options for new systems. You know, and that's uh, why we go back to these living, uh, focusing on living economies and food systems and stuff like that to be able to um, help people um, find those solutions. Uh, bringing us back to full circle, you know, that's um, the challenge is that people wake up and then they see all these negative stuff and then they get overwhelmed and they don't, and they go back to sleep. So while we feel it's important to hold the line for people who are just waking up, shoving them into battle seems to be the, uh, the least productive way. So giving them as, as challenging as it may seem, considering how the immense the challenges are and how we need to be acting fast, having the patience to allow people the space to start waking up and growing on their own by focusing them on positive things they can do is not ignoring the bad stuff, but it's creating, um, it's helping them to build up their strengths so they can tackle these larger challenges. And I think that's one of the key elements to getting people who want to wake up keeping them awake and keeping them engaged because if they get overwhelmed, they're just going to shut down. And I think we lose more people who wake up and don't have those positive outlets than we do for those who wake up knowing how bad things are. We can't, uh, we can't rise and uh, topple the imminently uh, industrialized, militarized war machine of corporate consumption and the, and the attempted consolidation and devouring of all life on earth on an empty stomach, huh? We need to wake up and and eat those greens, (laughs) the real greens, not that money stuff. And what we're finding out from the Holocaust and these other wars and like the, you know, even the Civil War and stuff is that the accountability can come later. You know, once once we end the fighting, once people are able to provide for themselves, then they'll be um, stronger to be able to hold these people accountable. And I think that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing groups giving land back to the natives. We're starting to see these groups recognize that there's profit in a healthy planet and her people and making those investments. So we know there are millions of dollars out there being invested by private equity companies that support sustainable agendas, that support indigenous cultures and their rights and support people to live free without impeding freedoms, uh, their freedoms upon other people. This is just uh, good reasoning for properly funding all of these things so we can uh, Indeed. You know, Again. We get the stuff that we need. We're able to manufacture at the same level these our opponents are. 
you know, and that's why, you know, that's the whole idea about our, uh, organizing as effectively as those who love war and utilizing the resources and the skills we have available to us to give people hope. Nurturing and planting those seeds of hope help people overcome the challenges of, of these dilemmas and these dogma and um, help people take the step in the right direction. So to specifically answer your question, if you're not growing food, plant something. Even if it's just in your window, even if you live in an apartment, plant something to clean the air, find a way to nurture life in a small way. And then once you do that, go out and find other people in your community that are also nurturing life and then do something together. Pick a project that's bigger than you would be able to handle on your own and try to tackle it with a group of people. Even if you fail in your initial attempt, you're gonna have a community of people that you can then uh, um, assess the situation and come up with new goals and try again. Well, how do we find you, Robert? How do we learn more about uh, what you're doing, your projects? Would you like to give us some, uh, you know, uh, your web address or anything like sure, that? Sure, we appreciate that. So the um, the Alliance for Reason and Knowledge has a webpage. It's a-r-k.us. Um, you can find me, Robert J. Shields, on Facebook, and I'm on LinkedIn and uh, getting into Twitter and stuff like that. But the, the Facebook page is a really great way to, to interact. There's lots of groups that are focused on specialized interests like food food, energy, and waste. And then there are groups that are focused on the collaboration and how they st- how they bring stuff together, like the 2150 Project. Um, and so basically, those are the, the primary ways to find us and get engaged. Getting Building groups of friends and people around advocacy and food is the best way for anybody who's feeling disenfranchised or who's feeling disappointed or who's feeling depressed that the world is too, you know, um, too bad. And people need to recognize that it doesn't matter if we're able to save everyone. We just need to save one and then one more and then one more.